friends and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today's guest is Jeff King. Hello, Zach. Hello. Thanks for having me. Jeff has had a, an amazing career starting with uh, moving to town in the 1980s and working with uh, uh, Patty Loveless, who uh, of course was a uh, you know kind of back to basics you know artist that had uh, spent a lot of time on television so you got to be on things like Austin City Limits and a lot of television oh yeah then uh, transitioned into studio work and worked with everyone from uh, Faith Faith Hill to Luke Bryan and uh, continued to do studio work and also has been able to kind of juggle doing live work with both Brooks and Dunn and Reba in the last couple of years so we're going to get uh, Jeff to tell us how he uh, moved to town, how he got into session work, and how he's able to, you know, juggle playing with two major acts at the same time. So thanks for coming on, Jeff. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you were, you were born and raised in the Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee. Yeah, I was actually born in Arlington, Virginia. Okay. And my folks worked for the government in D.C., and uh, we lived there for a year. And my dad, being from East Tennessee, uh, Townsend, which is in the Smokies, we moved back and um, grew up there until I went away to college. So then I went to East Tennessee State University, got a degree in uh, graphics and design engineering, which wow. very mathematical. I like math. Yeah. You know. So how'd you pick up the guitar? Well, that's a fun story. My, we used to go visit my grandmother for two weeks in the summer in West Virginia, in the hollers up there. And my uncle Kenneth, you know, as a kid, when you show up at your grandmother's, you're eight or nine, ten. I was ten. You know, you're snooping around the basement, which is scary because it's up there in West Virginia, and they have they at the time they had a coal furnace, so it was the grates and the thing behind, you know. Yeah. And the closets, looking around, I was like, oh, what's this? Pulled out a guitar. So I loved music, and I was like, well, this is interesting. So uh, who knows the tuning? But I just remember playing a string going, oh, that sounds cool. I'm playing, you know, somehow I may have gotten it into some tuning. I don't yeah. know what, but my folks said, well, all right, let's get some guitar lessons. So in Townsend, there wasn't a music store, of course, but there was my uh, family friends, the Sullivans, and they had a band and they were all fine musicians. They played different places around the area, you know, so, uh, the singer of the band, or there might have been more, but Ronnie Sullivan was was kind enough to come out and show me the few chords that I learned first, you know, and, and Wildwood Flower. I learned to play Wildwood Flower. And then uh, I went to school, and we had show and tell in the fourth grade, and I told uh, about the four major chords, G, C, D, and, and it might have been E, and the teacher was just... But anyway, so then I move on, and... Um, you know, really sparked an interest in me and uh, started listening to records and learning what made me feel something, like what made me feel emotion or what made me excited or, you know, how we sat down and we learned, try to learn from records and I mean, now it's so much easier with a amazing slow downer and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But back then, you just keep doing it until you get close <laughs> and I think with my ear, that's what I did. I got close, and I was like, okay. And then I kind of moved out from there, so. What was sparking your interest the most? Um, you know, the years are fuzzy to me about exactly who was when, but I kind of was, I loved the Atlanta rhythm section. I loved kind of Southern music, you know. Um, of course, I loved Leonard Skinner, but Marshall Tucker was a favorite of mine because uh, Toy Caldwell, I thought, yeah. was so, uh, just had such an emotional thing when he played, and I'm not sure when Martin Offer came on the scene, but that just was like, wow, this is the coolest thing I've ever heard. And of course, the Eagles, um, one of the ones that I can remember that drew me in was I Can't Tell You Why, and the guitar stuff on that was just, it's like, 
wow, this is super cool. I met with Don Felder, introduced by a friend. We had lunch together and I asked about 30 questions. He was telling us all about Hotel California and how that came to be. And then we ventured off into some other Eagles stuff and I've seen the documentary, so I didn't want to get in anything hazy, you know. Right. So well, I remember I asking him about, so I can't tell you why. What What's there to know about that? That's one of my favorite solos, hoping that he played it, but I didn't know. So he said, well, it's funny. He said, we, we all took a crack at solos on things and whoever kind of made the best fit, that's who did the solo. And um, he was like, that wasn't me. And I was like, he said, but Joe Walsh did one. And he said, and it was late at night and there was a lot going on and that's not Joe's. <laughs> so, but anyway, I think, uh, yeah. I'm not sure who played that one. It was Glenn Fry. Glenn Fry, right. Yeah. yeah. So beautiful, yeah. you know, the note choice. So beautiful. But Perfect. Anyway, you know, I kind of went down that road and, you know, like I said, drop the needle back and forth until you finally get something and then trying to learn, just like we all do, basic guitar stuff. And when did you start playing gigs? Well, so I was in and out of guitar through high school, football, baseball, basketball. And then I went to college and some guys on my floor played guitar. So we started playing together and I was really terrible. And we were probably, they were really good to, to the, my memory. And so we started, um, met a guy, I worked uh, part-time at a printing place there. And one of the guys there was a bass player and a singer and got to know him. And he said, well, let's, let's put a band together and start playing some VFWs and, and Elk Lodges and stuff. Mm -hmm. So my first gig, my first paying gig was, uh, in Elizabethan, Tennessee at the Elks Lodge. And we made $30 that night, two nights, $60 a weekend. It's like, wow, this is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, um, and then we just did that for the rest of my college days. And uh, it was really fun, you know? So was there any temptation to get it in, like while you were in college to switch majors or anything? I mean, when, when did, did you actually go out and do graphic design or work for a printer? When, when did you all of a sudden you decide, I've got to play music and I've got to move to Nashville? I think that's, uh, was, uh, for me, that was just sort of in me. Was like my plan was to get my degree and move to Nashville and get a job in my field or, you know, sometimes no plan is the plan, you know? Yeah. And, you know, fast forward to moving here, when I moved here, um, some friends I met said, hey, you should go to this club. There's a really good band there. So I was like, okay. And in East Tennessee, no disrespect to anybody, but at that time, a really good band was a different thing than a really good band down here. Mm -hmm. And because up there, that probably wasn't what they did for a living. Down here, probably was. So um, I went to this club called The Stagecoach down on Murfreesboro Road, you know. <laughs> and I walked in and I went, I don't know what to say. I thought I was a decent guitar player at that point. And that just, it was like, it was like the universe laughed at me and went, <laughs> let's see what happens. And so I met Brent Mason that night and we've been friends for, well, I've been here 40 years now. And so we've been friends 40 years and I just can't say enough about what that did. First, it smacked me down really hard and was, I was like, there's no way, you know, if everybody in town is like this, I must well find another thought, you know, but. <laughs> well, you were lucky in that not everyone was that, br but right, yeah, there right. are a lot of great players though. But, you know, then I started going, okay, like you do when you analyze things, I have a sort of an analytical view of that stuff. And I went, all right, I'm gonna go back I'm gonna start using this as, um, as an education and figuring out, you know, I don't, I don't wanna play like Brent, I wanna figure out what he's doing and so I can use that and that'll let, open up the world a little bit for me for, for playing. And um, 
So I went back, you know, maybe three nights a week and I'd sit there and all of a sudden we started coming in with these little uh, micro cassette recorders and it wasn't, I felt a little weird about it, you know, but I wasn't trying to do anything other than learn. Yeah. And, um, and when that stuff is happening, like, you know, I'm sure your, your people know Brent, but when that's happening, it's happening fast. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you can't just go, I'm going to remember that lick because it's the beginning of a, something that goes on and, and there, you know, it's phrasing. Yeah. And, and there's no iPhones, you're not able to video stuff. And so the most you can do is that. And so it's just funny in that there are a lot of stories about guys going down to see the Don Kelly band oh, and yeah. seeing Brent Mason and Jimmy Olander told me that, you know, he would hand the cassette player to Brent and Brent didn't mind. He would put it up near his amp. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, I felt a little weird about it, a little self-conscious. And then we just finally got, we were just like, you know, just yeah. four or five of them on the table <laughs> because all the guitar players would sit at this little round table over by Brent's, yeah. you know, amps. And, um, you know, that was just the beginning of learning and trying to figure that stuff out. And so I met four or five guys there and we were all became friends and, you know, we'd meet down there and, and we'd go out to the Waffle House or whatever. And I remember one night, um, one of the guys said, okay, let's talk about what we're going to do here. How, let's talk about everybody's plans. You know, I want to hear. And he said, um, I plan to give myself five years, and if, if I'm not touring or doing sessions or whatever, I'm, I'm probably going to go back to Virginia. And my dad's got a, uh, you know, real estate operation that's doing great. And the next guy's like, I'm going to give myself two years. And when it got to me, I was like, I'm not sure I'm smart enough to do this. You know, I don't, all I see is going forward. I don't know how to get there, and I don't know exactly where I'm going forward to, but... I need to follow this. Yeah. And, um, you know, sometimes being unaware is, is blissful and beautiful. You well, know? And, and the sometimes the no backup plan you know, has a benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've definitely got to put it all in or yeah. fail, you know, and then figure it out. But um, anyway, yeah. And then go ahead. Well, then Patty Loveless came along. How did, how did that come about? Who contacted you? Every gig I have has an interesting story. Yeah. Uh, so in East Tennessee, my friend Jeff Coppage lived beside me, or I can't remember. I don't think we were ever roommates, but he was the other guitar player in the first band that we had up there at the Elks Lodge. And then he went off to do other things. And so he left ETSU and moved down and started going to MTSU because he wanted to be a recording engineer. So he got into their program back in like 80, 81 maybe, something like that. And then he called me and he's like, hey, come down one week and I get this many hours. You know, we start at 9 p.m. and we have to be done by 9 a.m. And, and you know, I'm so excited, but don't really have any plan on what you're gonna play. So it's like get a band together and we just kind of jam over some chords, play blues and he, works on the snare for two hours and works, right. you know, we, I learned some stuff back then by being there with him. It was a place called, I think it was called the Haynes house. It was an old house and it had a two inch machine and big console and I don't remember what kind of console, but anyway, we stayed friends the whole time. And when I moved here, we hang out together and he started working for, uh, Jimmy Bowen as sometimes the names get fuzzy to me, but Steve was, was Jimmy's, one of Jimmy's engineers. I can't remember Steve's name right now, but uh, Jeff was his assistant. So Jeff just finished the Patty Loveless record. I mean, Patty just finished her record with Bowie. Right. And Patty's manager was her brother, Roger Ramey. And Jeff said, hey, Patty's going to put together a band and there might be an opening. Do you want me to pass your name on? So he did. And Roger, we were all green at the time. I mean, Patty had been playing a bunch of clubs and doing great stuff, but it was her first record deal. And I'd been doing clubs all over the U.S. and Canada and wanted something a little more 
a little cooler, you know, than playing Holiday Inns, which is nothing wrong with that because I learned a ton of guitar at those places. But all of a sudden I get a phone call, hey, we're going to get together over here. You want to come and want to come and play? I'm like, sure. So we got together at um, Acuff Rose, which was on 8th at the time. Do you remember that? Across from what yeah. Sonic is now, right? Yeah. And in the attic, <laughs> upstairs, it was kind of hot. But uh, Emery Gordy was there because he was playing bass on those records and he was kind of helping Patty put the band together. And so I show up and there's four other guys, a bass player, drummer, steel player, an acoustic player, and me. And we, I think we got the music early and tried to dig in and learn some of the stuff. So we went through a few songs and then, and then she said, well, okay, well, I guess we need to come back. Can we do like these next four days? And we leave and all, everybody leaves and we're going, well, do we get the job? <laughs> we, yeah. What are we doing, you know? Yeah. So um, we come back, got the job, I guess, because nobody said anything different. And Emery's there and he's helping us okay, this part might be a little different, you know, since it's just you guys and there aren't three guitar players, you're going to need to do this and this. And he was so helpful and, and generous and, you know, kind. And Patty was so awesome. And the music, you know, spoke for itself because, you know, mountain music, sad mountain music and just cool kind of the country version of what bluegrass might be, I would say, you know just hearing her voice, you know, so. I was there for six years. Yeah. And, you know, Emery, for those that don't know, you know, Emery Gordy Jr., you know, played bass with, with Elvis and Emmylou Harris and the Hot Band and, uh, of course, ended up marrying Patty later and producing, you know, many of her records. Yeah. And, uh, and then, of course, played bass on all sorts of things from Burning Love with Elvis oh, to yeah. on and on and on and, you know, just to... Uh, a st yeah, that's a high-level player that y'all had oh, man. in there. Uh, what a resource. Kind of guiding you through these things. Yeah. And, and then late nights on the bus, we got the stories. Oh, so he was on the bus with you? Occasionally he would come out yeah. on the road. And, yeah. Um, and there was, there was some funny stuff. There would be the stories, but later on when, after they were together, you know, we had two buses. We had a band bus and, a, and uh, Patty's uh bus and sometimes Emory would come over and hang out with us until two or three in the morning and I remember one night we go back to it we stopped at a truck stop and Emory said I'm gonna go back to my bus so he goes over he knocks on the door it's locked and because they didn't have the keypads then yeah Patty comes to the door and she just looks at him and says no and she turned around and walked off and Emory had to come back and get, he, had to, oh, no. he had to find a bunk on the band bus <laughs> well you know being on the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, those those albums, you know, of course you have some of the stuff that like Ray Flack played on, but then you, you start getting the stuff that Albert Lee played on. You have Timber, I'm Falling in Love. I mean, those are some, uh, those are some tough, you know, there's some interesting rolling and B-bender guitar stuff, and you were playing a guitar with a G-bender on it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and And so you were having to learn all that. Were you given like, of course now they'd call it stems, but were you given like any of the, like isolated guitar parts, or were you just hearing the tracks and and learning what Ray or or, or Albert or, or Richard Bennett or any of these guys right. did, or Steve Gibson, or Steve Gibson, yeah, Reggie? Um, no, we were just given the record, and yeah. I don't remember getting any stems for that stuff and trying to adapt the G to the B bender stuff. It was interesting. And yeah. But I always learn stuff, yeah. and um, I always felt overwhelmed while I was doing it. But um, every one of those guys played just beautiful stuff. You know, Albert in his stream of consciousness stuff would, would just be insanely awesome. And, you know, some of the uh, phrasing was unique and it would lead you into the 4E, you know, that what you would think would be thing, but. It, I don't know, somehow yeah. it just exposed a lot of stuff for me. It was like, here's a whole new world that you hadn't seen before. And so you've been playing clubs and such, and all of a sudden you're playing with a signed artist. What kind of gear did you have when you started um, playing with Patty? Did you go into debt buying gear, or did you 
Did you have anything mm, decent? Uh, you know what? I think I had at the beginning, I think I had the, an Ibanez UE405. Mm -hmm. Remember those? Yeah. And uh, it was a little multi effects yeah. little thing. Had a delay, had a compressor, a, de a chorus, an EQ, and a delay, I think. And you could change the order. And it had a loop where you could put a volume pedal. Yep. So, um, I think I had a Pro Reverb, which I still have, that my folks bought me as my second amp. Um, I think in 71, they bought me a Vibro Champ as my first one, which was, you know, <laughs> you get down, you hear that speaker, and you go, wow, yeah. this is so. And then, to be honest, I can't remember. Yeah. You know, I started with that, and at some point, I ended up with a rack and two Pacific cabinets. And, um, you know, some stuff started to get a little more like when Richard Bennett came in, like that kind of girl and stuff. It was, it seemed like I was taking the sounds that I heard on the record, like if the guitar had delay on it from the studio or reverb, whatever, then that's what I felt like I needed to, I needed to have whatever's coming out of the speakers. Yeah. So, you know, it got a little more complicated, but, you know, not that much. So. Yeah, it seemed like you would mainly be reproducing like cleanish sounds until some of the Richard Bennett stuff, like that kind of girl that got a little bit more, a little yeah. gainier than than some of the uh, the other stuff. And then I guess later on, some of the Steve Gibson stuff, like uh, "Hurt Me Bad in a Real Good Way," yeah, that was a little more chorused, clean and mm -hmm. stratty and such. Yeah, and um, and then Jorgensen, I think I can't remember if Jorgensen. We did a, a bunch of stuff with Patty and the Desert Rose Band. So somehow, I know he did a, one of her videos and I can't remember if he ever played. For some reason, yeah. we were just all together a lot yeah. back then. But, you know, jumping off of that, I was introduced to AC30s and that sound, which interestingly, Mark Sampson was John's tech and I would see Mark laying in the back of the stage. Uh, Jorgensen would have two AC-30s and he would have a cloth in one hand holding up tubes, you know, until he could get them to, to stay. And I'm thinking right back there sometime was born matchless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. Yes. It was, you know, again, from a conversation with John, uh, it was it was the fact that they were having a hard time keeping those amps going. Mm -hmm. That is the whole reason that the the uh, matchless amps came about. Yeah. <laughs> so you, yeah, and that and that John is the guy that uh, you know got Mark Sampson out of the middle of nowhere. Oh and, yeah. yeah, John and I were doing a session one day, and uh, I had my matchless in there, and he came into the room and he said, "Hey, can I?" Uh, can I offer some something for you? And I said, yeah, what's that? He said, try this setting. And he went, Pfft. I was like, wow, okay, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. You know, just how you hear things. And, you know, they're pretty simple with five, five way switch and a few knobs. But um, anyway, that was yeah. a fun moment. But so a lot of those, uh, a lot of tones during that era were, were direct. And is that one, I guess that kind of goes with the, uh, the rack setup and, mm -hmm. the, and the Pacific cabinets and using the EVs and things like that. That was kind of reproducing the, uh, the direct chorus right. uh, kind of sounds that you heard a lot. Did you have a, it seemed like I remember seeing like a boogie head that you had on, on one of your rigs. Well, you know, so we went, I went, I was thinking about moving to um, LA at one point. So I went yeah. out there with a friend for a while. And, uh, somewhere my friend Jeff Coppage moved there and I can't remember if it was before he came to Nashville or I think it was before. He spent a year or so, six months or something out there and got in and worked for some guys and said, come out and check it out. And so we went to Bob Bradshaw's place over there and I had done a gig with Patty out there and I think at the Greek theater or something and I had just stayed for a few weeks. So I had my guitar with me that had the bender on it and we were going over to Bob's and I just grabbed my guitar to take with me. So, you know, that was huge for me because Lukather, I mean, all the guys had those giant rigs and they sounded so great. And 
Um, I remember walking. We, we went to Bob's and knocked on the door and nobody was there yet. So there was a Waffle House across the street or some, some kind of diner like that. And my friend Dean Hall and I went in there and we're sitting there eating breakfast, waiting, because I think, you know, they probably opened around 11 or noon out there or something, Bob's place. And um, Bob came in <laughs> and ate breakfast. <laughs> and we didn't want to say anything because we were just as enamored by him as, yeah. you know. And so he goes across and we followed him over and said, hey, you know, we know we don't have an appointment, but we're from Nashville and just, this is all we see and this is what we love and can we see? some stuff and we spent some time with us. He said, sure. He said, started showing us rigs that he was working on at the time. And uh, he had a boogie head with no tubes. And he said, just pull the tubes out. I'm like, uh, it baffled me. So, you know, and, and then he had all the load resistors and I, you know, he taught us in about the 30 minute span how to use load resistors and go into these boxes and have level controls and you know all the stuff that we I did there for a while and um, and so I had my guitar and I was playing some stuff and using the bender and Bob was like what's going on here I've never seen anything like this and I'm like you work with the greatest guitar players in the world check this out mm -hmm. you know and he was like that's amazing and he's you know when you first try one it's not yeah. it's not easy but you get it pretty quick, but that was just a great, great time. And then I decided later on, I was like, I just don't think this is for me out here. So I moved back or didn't move back. I just didn't move. So, yeah. So you had, you were using basically amps and, and this Ibanez multi-effect thing. And then you went to a rack set up with the, with the speaker cabinets and everything. Yeah. With the power amp. And then, you know, you have your head with the pull tubes and, I can't, I don't think I had a load resistor because I didn't need one, but, um, you know, at some point we all had those little gold things that the big round things and, um, but I, you know, went through some effects and just tried to get the, a cleaner, better sound of what I was hearing on records with a little yeah. bit of chorus, some of that delay stuff and the nice verbs. So then along came the studio preamp, the boogie studio preamp and uh, from there, my rigs just went crazy because I started getting into more studio work and hearing more sounds, and I felt like I needed more options. You know, I'd, it's always a fear to show up and not be able to get a whatever sound. Right. Um, the producer's so, going to ask you for a sound that you can't produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up. Probably with my biggest rack rig, I had the um, Soldano X88 and the Boogie uh, preamp in there, and the ability to plug a head in and use it as a uh, with a load and use that. And had the VHT Chrome 2150 power amp that um, I think Dan had one as well. And um, you know, it just you know, things get out of hand. Yeah. <laughs> so how did? Um how did the transition, for, give us the transition from Patty Loveless to playing in the studio. You know, so I'm guessing you were, I mean, because you go from being a little bit green, mm -hmm. you know, playing with Patty, and then of course you're, you know, then you play with her for six years, yeah. and you get a lot of experience playing on television, playing bigger and bigger shows. And a lot of time to practice, and a lot of time to listen to those records and figure out tones and parts and try to figure out why, which is an interesting thing, you know. Um, plus, when she would do records, I would go, you know, she said, you can come, come to the record, you know. And I'd go meet Reggie and Steve and Larry London and Mac yeah. McAnally and John Jarvis and Paul Franklin and, you know, all the guys that um, were my idols then because, um, just a quick backstory, when I moved here in 1983, still vinyl. Every record I had, <clears throat> I knew every player and what they sounded like mm -hmm. and what they had played on. And I called a lot of guys when I got here and I called Brent Rowan and said, Brent, how do you get these sounds? Well, he would call me back and spend an hour. It's like, yeah. okay, on that record, I did this and this and this. Um, 
But anyway, going forward, that's how I learned how you think about these kind of things. So that, that's amazing because you know guests in the studio are are not really the norm. A lot of people don't like you know because there's always you know label people and management right, and all yeah. that other kind of stuff, and usually you know they don't like guests. So the fact that Patty included you and let you watch these things yeah. go down and let you learn from that that was wow. it was cool and, yeah and albert didn't want to leave albert he was there a lot and she was cutting at that time over at um soundstage when it was a room with no walls so they had big monitors up and then when we would when they would cut everybody was on headphones so you you could take your headphones off and hear larry london over there but whoever was playing guitar was probably direct you know I remember Reggie going direct, and uh, Leland Sklar was there some, and Glenn Wharf, and um, so anyway, I learned kind of a little bit about the studio scene there, enough to be really um, confused about it. <laughs> so as Patty, as the Patty gig went on, um, towards the last two or three years of it, I met a bunch of publishing guys that were doing lots of demos because. It was a crazy world in Nashville back then. Yes. You know, every every day, every studio was going all day, you know. And yeah. some of these guys I made friends with, they were like, hey, um, why don't you come over and play on a session? And my first session, session that I remember, I showed up and it was, uh, it was Glenn Wharf and Steve Nathan and... Uh, um, can't think of the drummer right now, but tiny little studio about the size of this room. And you know, by that point I had a, a rack and stuff and luckily the engineer was my friend Jeff Coppage. So we cut the, you know, four or five songs, whatever, and um, I stayed <laughs> and fixed everything I did wrong because I was completely freaked out. Milton Sledge was the drummer. Okay. So all yeah. these guys, I, I knew their name and knew all the records yeah. they were on. I was just freaking out. So I'd dial in these uh, songs to get them closer to what I thought they should be. And I got better and faster and I got a few more sessions and I got better and faster. And then I met ba band guys, started seeing some of the same guys and um, you know, from there, it just sort of blossomed into more stuff. And then I left. I was like, I can't, I don't think I can be out here. I, I think I want to go do this for a while because we were starting to get some of the same tours again, being at the same venues again. And I loved Patty for the, the, uh, the gift she had given me of, of letting me learn while I was there. And, um, uh, it was hard to leave, but I remember the exact moment hanging up the phone with her and she was like, however I can help you, you, you just, you know, it's been awesome and all this and, you know, really emotional for me. And I hung up the phone with, from a really good paycheck to click zero right then. So I started playing clubs around town, doing writer's nights, and I could already read charts, but I'd do these writer's nights on Monday nights out at the Holiday Inn Browley Parkway, you'd show up, and a writer would walk on stage and hand you a chart and go, ding, 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 here's, here's kind of how it goes. Yeah. Three, four, and I started coming up. I was like, okay, well the song needs a lick at the top. Yeah. So I started coming up with licks, started learning how to play solos like that off the cuff and fills and, and before long I could read charts like crazy thanks to my friend Chaz Williams. I don't know if you know Chaz, he ended up writing a book on chart you know, Nashville number system, but, um, so that all kind of snowballed into more sessions and more stuff like that. And for long, I, I wasn't able to keep up doing those kind of playing things just because sessions got crazy for me. And, um, but it was a crazy time and everybody was crazy. So we were all doing three or four sessions a day, you know, start at 10 in the morning, get home at midnight and not every day, but you know, a lot. Oh, <laughs> 
So you're getting to do these, these gigs where you're having to read charts, you're having to come up with hooks, you're doing these things, you're playing on demo sessions, you're going to school. Big time. Big time going to school. Yeah. Uh, and so also you're, you're entering this, this world. You, you, it was the perfect timing because there's all this work. You're getting to do all, all, all this you know, lower level studio work because you know, you're gonna be competing with all these guys that are you know, your heroes and that you've been kind of emulating what they did, you know, whether it was on the road or even. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, like we're saying, Albert, you, know, you learn that stuff and with the bender and, you know, Steve Gibson had benders as yeah. well, right? Yeah. And, and Brent Rowan. Yeah. And Brent Mason. And there were so many guys then that were big influences on me. Uh, those guys, all of them, Chris Losinger, you know, um, man, there's just, it's just so many ways to skin a cat, you know? Yeah. Um, so I learned how to do that. And then uh, I think my, one of my first record dates, um, there were two, and I can't remember which came first, but they were both overdubs. And one was on a Pam Tillis thing that had a Bender thing on the demo that my buddy Walt Aldridge had played uh, from Muscle Shoals. And so I went in and played the Bender parts on this song. And I, I can't remember the name of it, but it was uh, with Pam. And Pam wasn't there, it was just me and her engineer and, and maybe the producer. But that was interestingly fun and nerve wracking. And then, um, in the 90s, as I started doing more sessions, I got a call from Walt, and I started going down to Muscle Shoals and doing a lot of stuff at Fame. And then I kind of was started, you know, on some of those sessions, David Hood would be playing bass, and Roger Hawkins would be playing drums, and, you know, Spooner or whoever would be, you know, I'd kind of thrown in with some of those guys down there. And, um, boy, here you, here's another huge lesson of philosophical music, you know, on, on the, where the beat is and, and just how to do things. And, um, so I, I, I don't know where I was going with that, but I, I used to go down there. And so Rick Hall asked me to, he said, we were in Studio B one day cutting demos with Walt. And he said, uh, I can't remember if this was pre-planned or he came in that morning and said, son, can you move over to A and, and, and do a, um, uh, a song with me? I need to do um, uh, a Marie Osmond, Marie Osmond song. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And so I went over and spent, you know, however many hours with Rick and I was like, wow, this is starting to be fun, you know? I mean, it already was fun because I'm just playing guitar for a living and thinking up stuff, you know? And then um, from there, people would hear demos and you get called and you just start going to play on more records and, and you know, just living the dream. There were also a number of, uh, you know, there was, you know, the Nashville Network and CMT, and there were a lot of like country music shows and country music, you know, all these television shows, and sometimes they had staff or house bands and stuff. I remember seeing you a number of times on like, um, you know, the, there was a Ricky Skaggs thing that he did like Monday night at the, at the Ryman and such, yeah. and I remember them having like, Every week there was a different a different guy. I'd be you know Brent Mason, Brent Rowan, you, and all sorts of other cats, and start getting in the uh, also kind of house bands on on TV shows also. Yeah, those were some fun weeks. Those were done done you usually in a week, a season a week, or maybe maybe two weeks. Um, but I would do a handful of them, and Brent Rowan would do some, and, and like I said, Brent Mason, and I'm not sure whoever. But um, it, those were long days. Yeah. I, f I think I remember getting there around 8 or 9 in the morning, getting home at around 10 at night. But then I had my book and a CD of what we were going to do the next day. So I would spend a couple hours going over this stuff, yeah. show up in the morning, and then we would kind of do our thing for the morning and do rehearsals and rehearse these songs. And then we would come in and do rehearsals with the artists and everything. It, TV stuff is not how you see it on TV, as you know, you know, you yeah. show up. And I remember one day 
we did two shows every day. One day we had Don Gibson on and, and some more country things like that. The following show that night was Michael W. Smith. And it's like, whew, you know, changing worlds. But at that point I had my big rack stuff because that's what was going on. And um, fortunately, when Michael W. Smith had a song called My Place in This World, do you remember that? Yeah. And, which a great song. And big crossover. Yeah. Big crossover. Dan Huff played this amazingly blazing, brilliant solo. And I remember when that came out and I heard it for the first time, I went home and went, I'm going to learn this solo because this is cool. So when it came time to play that song, I was like, whew. I'm so glad I learned this. <laughs> you, you did your homework without knowing it. I, yeah, but then I said, had to dig in a little harder. But, you know, I mean, extreme days like that. And, and we had, um, um, you know, sometimes I, I forget there's been so much stuff, but um, piano player with a big white beard. Um, Leon Russell? Leon Russell was on. Yeah. I've never heard a piano so loud ever in my life. And you open up his piano, it's like under the hood stuff. I mean, huge monitors everywhere. And But Leon was so awesome and ended up talking with him. You know, sometimes you don't get a chance to speak with people, but I was just standing there and, and he just started talking to me and he said, hey, um, I like that Bender stuff you're doing. And I was like, I didn't even know, I didn't even know that he thought I existed. Right. You know, because I'm in another part of the stage and I was like, Wow, that's cool. You know, we talked yeah. for a bit, and um, there was uh, Ray Price and the, his piano player Blondie, yes, who could magically transform you know a basic sounding country chart into something that had chords like this, mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> it's just amazing stuff. David Hungate, Paul Lam, Harry Stinson, Aubrey Haney. Uh, I think Paul Franklin was there. Um, and I'm sure there are other guys. Uh, Gary Smith, Gary Bud Smith, who, um, you know, unfortunately is gone. But yeah, those were some great days. But that was a lot of work. Yeah. You, you don't think about the fact that it's like you're, you're, you're rehearsing and filming and then you're getting ready and then you're having to learn the tunes for the next day. Because every day was like every episode had like three or four artists yeah. on there and there was always diversity. I mean, it wasn't oh, yeah. like you just had like, you know, and you had an older act and usually up, or, up and coming guy and someone that was established. So. Yeah. yeah. Those were great times because they were so diverse, you know, and um, we rehearsed. And then we would flip around backwards and, and they would do, uh, they would do, <laughs> we would have to get dressed, like dress rehearsals, so they could film um, from off stage. Or they actually, they would film on stage, up, you know, close ups and stuff if you're playing a solo, which sometimes got complicated. If you were doing a song that had a, that type of solo where you started off, you just didn't have time to learn it note for note, but you started yeah. off and you tried to end like it, but in the middle you kind of became your own thing. So when they're up close, you, you know, you're trying to not let them be right here because that night you might be playing something different, you know? And, right. Um, well, I, I, <laughs> so I would the, always go to the guy, <laughs> Tom, I would go to Tom and say, use that close up for that because I didn't play it the same, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. You know, he'd yeah. laugh. They'd, but then they'd write it down, and yeah. sometimes they would do that. But and sometimes I, I, we'd have to fix stuff. Because I, I was I was at a number of those tapings yeah. because they would uh, they would just uh, they would just invite Belmont students out there because they wanted to have a you know a full audience for those you know tapings, and so I went to a bunch of them, and so I never saw cameras on stage really. Right, and yeah. so I didn't think about the fact that y'all did another run through where they were just doing close ups of because that makes total sense because you know you know they, there's no there's no cameraman on stage right. yet all of a sudden when you watched the show there were some close ups of the guitars and such yeah yeah the um, there was so much funny stuff the or for me it was funny because I've never been in that type of situation but the, there were wardrobe girls first time we'd had wardrobe to pick out stuff. And they would come up after those run-throughs and they'd say, okay, this is this show. Stand right there. And they would take a picture of you, every one of us, so, you know, one at a time. 
Then we would go to go eat dinner and we'd come back and we'd do the last show first. And then they would come around with their Polaroids and they would go, uh, you got a different shirt on. <laughs> it's like you got to go back and change shirts, you know, <laughs> put the shirt back on that you had. Yeah. Oh, no, I got spaghetti on. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Oh. How, how much, you know, because obviously Ricky's, you know, multi-instrumentalist producer and such. How much was, was he calling shots versus who was kind of the, acting as the MD on that? Harry Stinson, I think. Um, but it was sort of a joint thing. Uh, Ricky sometimes would come to me and say, um, it, it was never on when the guest, you know, cause Ricky would always do a couple songs and right. I think I missed highway 40 blue, all those blistering fast things because, which was totally cool with me because, you know, I was a nervous wreck anyway, but a couple times Ricky would come over on his songs and say, Hey, um, this is the way we did this in studio, you know, would you mind? I'm like, sure. Oh, wow, that's great to know that. Yeah. Okay, I would have never thought of that. But but Ricky was awesome, you know. I, we've been friends since then, so, um, or probably before then, because we did a lot of stuff with Patty, with Ricky Skaggs, and um, it was fun being on there with him. He's talent, unbelievable, you know. What do you, I mean, yeah. nothing to say. But what do you just, say? Yeah. yeah. So you you continue to do you know session work. You're doing stuff for Reba and Faith Hill. You're working with Dan Huff and other producers, and and then you know probably in the mid 2000s you start going out on the road again. And this time it's with Reba. Well, yes. Um, my wife Tammy Rogers is an she's a fiddle player and, and the steel and, drivers and the steel drivers now. Yeah. yeah. Um, she was actually playing with Reba at that point, and I had done a couple of Reba records. Um, Jerry McPherson and I were the two guitar players, electric players on those, the ones that we did together. Um, and then I get a call from Reba's manager, Narvel, and he says, hey, um, Jerry has been playing with us, but he's gonna go do some Faith Hill stuff, and would you like to come out and play a guitar on some gigs? I'm like, hmm. It's interesting because uh, until then I hadn't given any thought to going back out on the road because I was, you know, dug in into my studio work. And um, so I thought about it and I'm like, well, my wife's out here, you know, this could be fun. And we were doing like 25 dates a year. So nothing was going to get in the way of other stuff, I hoped. So I said yes. And um, fortunately I didn't have to, you know, do any um, auditions or any of that stuff. And kind of like the Patty things, like, <clears throat> am I doing, am, are we? Are we? <laughs> yeah. So I no, showed up here rehearsals the rehearsals. You know. <laughs> you're the guy. <laughs> and I got, I got the tapes from the band leader and the, um, learned how to, what Jerry was doing. And I cross-referenced everything with the records. And um, it was the first gig that I had done that was that big time, uh, meaning that we rehearsed a lot before we did anything. Um, it seems like, if if my memory's correct, we did like two weeks over at, <clears throat> excuse me, Soundcheck, and getting all the songs together because I think I was the, no, I think John Jarvis started the same time I did. So John and I were in that first band and, well, not the first band, but you know. Um, right. My first incarnation of that band. Um, so we did two weeks and then we went over to uh, what's now Bridgestone in the back and they have a huge big place. Yes. So they set up all the production stuff and I'd never seen that. So I walk in and go, what the, wow, this is the biggest thing I've ever done, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so then we rehearsed for a week and then we learned all the, okay, you're going to play a solo, you know, go, here's your, we're going to put an X here to be here every day. On that solo, you go to that spot and she'll do whatever she does. And, you know, no dancing or any of that stuff. Just. I think that's one of the things that people don't understand about the shows, you know, like Reba or like, you know, it's like the guitar players don't just like 
moved to some random spot during the guitar solo. It's like yeah. they've got so lighting and video and everything because all those things are such important elements to those that level of show. It's like you're going to hit this spot. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and everything has to be rehearsed out. One, the music has to be rehearsed towards backwards and forwards, and you can play it in your sleep. And then you've got to know where I have to be. It's like camera blocking. And, Absolutely. And, you know, it's like all of a sudden, you know, these are your spots to be during this song, and you're going to, you know, mm -hmm. do this at that point. Yeah, and that was important, and that was the first time I'd ever been on a gig that I knew exactly what I was going to play every night. And... You know, to some people that might be boring, but to me it was like, okay, <clears throat> I know what I'm going to play. Now my challenge is to play it to see if I can get through one night without making a little, oh, a, you know, yeah. or whatever. You're distracted by something or whatever. But we did it enough to where we just knew what your hands knew where to go, what to do, you know. So, and at some point your body knew where to go, what to do. And then there would be little variations of things that would work themselves out. You know, m meeting with the other guitar player for a part or fiddle player or whatever. But a lot of that was, was pretty staged. And, and you're right, the, the lighting guys had to know where you're going to be because they're calling, you know, here's the guitar player spot. If you're not there and you're over there, yeah. two things, this is weird, and you're over there in the dark. So... No one's gonna see you. No one's gonna see you. And <laughs> what, what were some of the? Uh, because I, when I, you know, one Reba has had such a long career. Mm -hmm. I mean, because she was having hits back in the '70s, and then oh, yeah. yeah, and so you think about the material that you're covering, the different eras of players, and also the variety of tones that you're gonna have to have to cover, and then some of the like really interesting stuff, like some of the wah wah stuff that's like on. Uh, um, you know, is that on Radio. Fancy or, or or which which are the oh, yeah. some well, of the, some of the stuff that has like the uh, the you know some mm -hmm. interesting wah wah parts you know the Fancy has some stuff but it's lap that's, steel or yeah is it that's the night the lights went out in Georgia is that the one with the with the wah wah stuff on it that's one of them and that's yeah you know a slide part or oh really yeah 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 um, and then there's uh, the radio song, which yeah. is yeah. that was the Jim Kimball, the other guitar player. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, there's a lot of diversity out there. And um, gear-wise, I started with amps, two heads, and two cabinets. And that show moves so fast, you can't. It, you know, as I said, it was the biggest show I'd ever done. So I had a guy talking in my ear telling me the next song as the yeah. one's fading out. And at that point, there's a guy handing you a guitar and there's a patch change and you're starting it. Dang. So I adopted to go with another uh, set of gear. And the front of house guys were like, you know, sometimes the mic falls. Can you, you know, any chance we can do direct? I'm like, whoa, you know. So I found um, a fractal rig, and I set that up, and I'm still not finished editing for those songs. It It's just ongoing hours and hours until you, you know, wow, could you use one more delay? Because we're tweakers. Yeah. With all of us guitar players. And But anyway, I got it enough to what I, I the best I could, and now it's just hit a button, and it changes amps, changes settings, changes BPM times, all that stuff, and I have a wah or I don't have a wah or I have a tremolo, you know, so um, it just was fast, so. Yeah, that's it's one of those kind of necessary sacrifices you yeah. have to make for the for the show because it just doesn't make, because you're trying to cover all these different guitarist parts and yeah. and sometimes, you know, arrangements are different live too, and you oh, might yeah. do a medley or who knows what, so. Yeah. yeah, and we're playing arenas, so, you know, there's a lot of going on, and, yeah. Yeah, you know, we did the best, it's, yeah. you know, so. Then how did, then of course, uh, Reba and Brooks and Dunn have done shows together and stuff. How did the Brooks and Dunn connection, how did you start playing with them? I had um, known Ronnie and Kicks from, from in town. I'd played on some stuff with them, and... Um, we started in 2015. Reba said, we're gonna do a residency in Vegas. And the, the session players in the band were like, oh, what does this mean? Yeah. 
oh, oh, it means is we're going to go out there three or four times a year for like 10 days, 12 days and do some shows. Oh, yeah. okay. So it's going to be with Brooks and Dunn. So they kind of combined bands. We had all of the Reba band and then we brought in, well, they brought in, uh, you know, Ronnie and Kicks wanted a couple of their guys. So that makes sense. They wanted to be comfortable. So they brought in a guitar player and um, their drummer at the time. So maybe their fiddle player. Um, so we did those gigs for, we we're supposed to do seven years, but we did six because of the COVID thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that they had been doing very many gigs because maybe they stopped in 2010. And I mean, I could be wrong about that, but I'm not yeah, sure they, they retired kind of, you know. Yeah, so in uh, 2015, they were like, hey, we want to go do two dates at this Chicago festival. You know, we want to get some of our old band back together. We want a couple of you guys to come with us. And they asked me to go. And I was like, great. So entirely different gig, you know, um, gear wise, entirely different. Just to use a, you know, whatever amp I had. Like at some point it was an AC30. Now it's a deluxe and a pedal board and still moves fast, but it's a different kind of music too. So, um, so they did maybe two gigs the first year, and the next year maybe five, and then it kind of developed into, hey, we want to go do uh, a fall tour. And fortunately, they had the same management, and I was able to do both because it wasn't just me. It was four of the guys from the band and a few guys from the crew, and um, and so we were they were scheduling the stuff so we could do everything. I'm sure it wasn't for us, but it worked out that way. So, yeah. Um, and that's just what we did this year. Reba had an early year this year, and um, we did maybe 20 something dates. And then we just finished Brooks and Dunn a couple weeks ago, 25 dates. And basically, I have the summer off with the exception of a few one offs. So, um, it's, it's a whole different thing. It's a different level of it's different music, just different everything. You know? Yeah. Also, you know, I guess with Brooks and Dunn, a lot of it, you know, of course, was uh, was Brent Mason. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, Kenny Greenberg was in some of that stuff. Yeah. and he, you know, Kenny's always awesome. Love playing with Kenny, and he always comes up with great stuff. And um, you know, we're two guitar players in that band, so we're loud and. We weren't really loud, but we looked loud. <laughs> so I think I saw one of your videos where you had your deluxe, uh, your deluxe reverb amplifier in a road case. Yeah, well, then it got to that. Yeah. yeah. So, so did you get so the uh, uh, the uh, the vocalist in the band, aka the big names, did they yeah. did they come down on you or what, you know? No, we kind of came down on ourselves because uh, we were only adding to the chaos up there, and uh, there's side fills on this gig Ooh, and yeah. they are incredibly loud yeah which makes for a great sounding stage and I, at one point I had a a, a brown uh, a brown basement head into a 212 Marshall cabinet or might have been its own cabinet but if I turned around it was like Whoa! And yeah. so I had to be careful and then if I walked over to the the, the speakers over there it you know you had to so I thought, you know, this is insane. We're all going deaf. We're all getting older. We're all, you know. Yeah. Um, so Lou and I and and Charlie, both, all of us, uh, Charlie Crow was the first, was the guy I played with first there. And, uh, you know, we were like, let's just do this. And I can't remember if there was a hint. Yeah. But um, I was concerned because the fiddle player stood behind me on a little riser. And if I'm that loud and then some of it's going back, it, you know, just causing chaos. So. Um, we decided to go inside a road case and they just push it back there somewhere and we're done, you know. Because you're in in ears. Yeah, you so were in ears. So so are people so are you know, kicks are running, are they pulling like an ear out? I mean, why do they have the side fills that are so loud? I mean, I guess they you know, I guess it's just the feel of it. I mean the feel of it and I think they both occasionally pull an ear out and yeah. you know, from it doesn't matter how much you have everything the same on stage. Every venue is just going to bring something, you know, I, who yeah. knows, but it's just yeah. the way it is. So, um, 
But that, that's one of the things that's interesting because, you know, when people started using in-ear monitors, it was just that whole thing where, you know, front of house controlled and the monitor world, they controlled everything. Yeah. And so then it's been interesting in that, you know, kind of amps kind of made their comeback and now sometimes they're live, sometimes they're in a case and then sometimes you, you're running into band, you know, artists that have big side fills. Oh yeah. 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 With Reba, there's, there are no amps on stage. The only thing live are, are drums. Yeah. And, um, you know, with Brooks and Dunn, <clears throat> we all have amps, the guitar players and the steel player and uh, the bass player has an amp up there. And, you know, it, it's a different kind of stage. It's just, but it's a, again, it's a different kind of music. So yeah. it's a little more honky tonk and ruckus kind of, you know, so it's all fun. Yeah. Favorite solo to play with Reba and favorite solo to play with Brooks and Dunn? Um, boy, I think Reba, it'd probably be, uh, radio. Yeah. It's pretty fun. Kind of bluesy, kind of, kind of quirky at the end a little bit. And, um, Lou does a lot of the solos on Brooks and Dunn because when we were doing Vegas, I didn't want to start doing, you know, we needed to keep things separate. So I do a few things with with Brooks and Dunn, uh, we do a, on Hard Working Man, it's really fun. We, it's a total blowout of guitars, you yeah. know, so there's, you know, we have a lot of solos and at the end there's just this massive chaos thing going on where we're playing back and forth and, you know, Ronnie's somebody's elbow and you're in kicks and running into you trying to, you know, it's just, and then we go into a little harmony part, so that's a lot of fun at yeah. the end, so. <clears throat> Jeff, we're going to talk gear, and I'm going to start off with, you know, this has kind of been your uh, your companion for a long time. This is a rare Joe Glazer built Telecaster with a G-Bender on it. So tell us how this came about, why you ordered it, tell us the whole story. Yeah. Well, 80, 1985, so um, I had, before that, I had um, a Tele you know, 70 something or other, nothing. And I had palm pedals on it. Do you remember the big, yes. big palm pedals? One yes. would come out and they, they had little, you know, they would bend up, like out of the way, and then they would bend down and one kind of came up and went this way and one went out and went that way. Yes. So when I moved to town, I knew of one guy. I didn't know anybody, I knew of one guy from, from my area back in East Tennessee, Steve Hembry. Um, and he was very kind to me when I was here, you know, spent a lot of time with him and talked about stuff. And he, you know, taught me some stuff. And he had a bender on there. I kept thinking, that is the smoothest, coolest thing I've ever heard. He had a B on, on here. And he was a great singer. And uh, I used to go hear him play and sing as well. So I had both palm pedals. And I found out the G was always in my way. So that's the one I used the most. And occasionally I'd use the B, but I learned more about the G. So when I went to Joe, you know, everybody at that point, everybody had Glazer benders and, you know, he was doing all that stuff out in his little shop in Leaper's Fork. So I went out there with my friend Dean Hall and I said, I want to order a guitar, Joe. And Joe has, we've been friends for 40 years or 37 or whatever. and. You know Joe, yeah. So there's a little bit of always kind of 
this going on. Oh, yes. Like, you, I don't think you, you really don't want one of these. And I'm like, but I do. But I do want one, Joe. Yeah. It's like, okay, what? Didn't, let's, let's talk about it. Okay, I want this and this. And, you know, can you make it blue? Sure, okay. And I want a bender. Okay, I want a bender on the G string. Okay, so uh, I think it was around the time I had started with Patty too. So I was real excited about getting this guitar. Months and months, you know, of, of work on it. And uh, we'd go out there and check it out. And uh, okay, here's your body. I just spray painted it. It's like wow, beautiful. And it wasn't this color, you know. It right. was different, but it was brighter. It was brighter <laughs> and, and lighter, and, and yeah, less dinged. But um, then and and here we're working on your neck and. Like a, well, there's a story I'll tell you. Yes, that's the, the second, second neck. <laughs> yeah, 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 the yeah. second neck. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, I was so excited. And Joe says, finally, hey, I think your guitar will be playable next week. You want to stop by and let's tweak it a little bit. I said, okay. So I showed up. And I was so excited to get down and I'm playing. And, I'm, and all of a sudden I go, Joe. And, and he said, what's wrong? And I said, this is a B-bender. I don't, I, I don't I don't want a B bender. I don't know how to do that. I want a G bender. And he went, oh, okay. And I was getting ready to go. I was so excited. I took it with me to get on the bus to go do some dates with Patty that weekend. I got back, took it right back out there, and he said, yeah, we'll uh, we'll make it a, a B. I mean a G. Yeah. So, um, you know, this was still got all the stuff for the B, but all the holes and everything. But uh, he made it a B, a G, and I don't know, it just fit me, and it just, you know, so, you know, you can... Some of the steel things. Um, it, it sounds more... It sounds more guitaristic in a way mm -hmm. because it's on a on a fatter string and it just and I think so many people are, are tempted to go into like the Clarence White and Albert Lee licks that I think yeah I always thought the G bender by itself had a little bit more of an individualistic you know kind of sound. I think sometimes it has the I don't know what's happening here sound. Yeah. You know, um, there were some guys. Uh, and I'll say this with respect to them, when we're out on the road, they would come up after the show and go, man, you've got strong hands. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, some of those bends that you do, I, I can't do those. Like I had this thing for a while where I was in <laughs> Go from a C to <laughs> As I'm bringing <laughs> He's like, I can't reach back behind the nut and do it. And I'm like, well, you know, it's, yeah. sometimes things are not as they seem, you know. So tell me, when you ordered this, so because a lot of the guitars, this is the only one I've seen uh, that didn't have a pit guard on it, or at least it was less common. Well, uh, I guess I have seen one or two others that didn't have a pit guard, but was that your idea or Joe's? <laughs> Neither one of us, really, because... Steve Warner had this set up, right? Early right, on, the, the three middle. pickup. Yeah. 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 So I wanted that, and um, so I snatched it pretty quick, and I took it back and finally had the bender fixed, snatched it again pretty quick, and I went back, you know, the following week or whatever after, and I said, hey, we didn't put a pig guard on this. And Joe said, well, we didn't, did we? And so we laid it up on there, and he went, so we got about 10 pick guards, different colors, and put it on. It's like, white one. Nah. A black one, no, nah, you know, a turk, um, tortoiseshell, you know, shell yeah. and it's like, no, nah, and we both just kind of went, let's just leave it, which, you know, then this happened over the years. And, yes. Um, but it's just the way it came to be. Everything about this has Made me so happy. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, and did you tell him like neck shape or anything like that? I mean, what did you just tell him you wanted a, a three pickup telly with a G bender or? Yeah, but you know, there's a there's a neck shape, and we went through a few things, and you know, as again with 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 Joe, it's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he he knows better than you do. He, he does, he, and he does. It's you know? it's not you know it's uh, not a show. It's no, for real. Yeah. yeah, he's genius. And so 
it got this knack, and, and it's funny, I ordered a Strat, um, just straight up Strat, no, no bender, and uh, had a Wilkinson bar on it. And he, uh, I said, I want, I want this neck though. I gotta have this same, this, I love this neck. And he said, okay, so we measured the neck, you know, with his thing that he has. And whenever I went back to pick up the Strat, I was like, the neck's different. He went, no, it's the same neck. And I'm like, the neck's different, Joe. And he's like, well, all right, let's measure them, bring it, you know. And, and it was similar, if not really close, I think the way you, hold the, you know, just everything about the Strat is a different feel. So yeah. for me, it might be just my angle of playing on the Strat became confusing to me. And, but that was always an argument and then it became a fun argument, you know, so. Yeah. But Joe has been um, my go-to guy since 85, yeah. you know. I mean, there are other guys that are great in Nashville, but Joe is, uh, you know, there have been times when I've been on a session at 10 a.m. and I'm, like I'm going to do a two o'clock in Berry Hill and all of a sudden there's a problem, like something buzzing. And I'll go, I'll call over there and go, Joe, listen, I got a problem. Can you bring it by tomorrow? And I said, well, I'm working all day tomorrow, but we finish here at one and I've got a two o'clock in Berry Hill. And he's like, okay, <laughs> drop it off. And go eat lunch and come back, and yeah. we'll have it done for you. You know, I probably shouldn't say that because yeah. some things are months out for right. over there. But yeah. we've been, you know, doing this a long You're time. You're a so. long, a long time customer. Yeah. So, uh, and and I learned this from watching uh, Marty Schwartz did a good job of of kind of doing, uh, you know, a thing where he covered a lot of your guitars, and he told and you told some stories about this, and I only know about this because of Marty's show. So I'm going to give him credit. Uh, this is the second neck on the guitar. Right. And so what happened to the first one? When I was with Patty, we were out with George Jones and there was a drum riser and it had two big, you know, big black speakers on it, you know. And one there had a little two before in the front on the top one. And so it was leaning back just a tiny bit. And um, we had all our guitars lined up across the back kind of behind our amps, you know, standing up. And fortunately, Steve Henson was in the band and he had his old 50, 60, whatever telly sitting beside mine. But so at some point so during somebody's sound check, it, it wasn't ours, but um, because I was in catering when this happened, I think it was on George's sound check. Um, that monitor was so loud, it moved and it went whoop. And mine was sitting in a stand and it landed on top of it. And we never found all the parts to the neck. It mm. just, it splintered the neck into tiny bitty pieces and it broke this little piece. And yeah. And I ended up using, there was no hope to use this at all because there was no neck yeah. gone. Yeah. <laughs> so I used Steve Henson's telly the rest of that weekend. And, you know, <laughs> I had a guitar, uh, a gig bag and I, went into Joe and I had the body in it and what are maybe a couple pieces of the neck stuck in there, folded over and I went in, I set it down on the counter and I said, Joe, he went, this can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so he, he, he opens it up and he's like, my gosh, what, what happened? You know? And I said, well, the same thing, the monitor fell off in the thing. And he's like, oh my gosh. And so he said, um, you got something you can use for a while? And I'm like, yeah, I've got other stuff. But I'd like to get this back because it's my main telly, you know. Yeah. So he, uh, he works on uh, neck for a while. And I call him and say, how's it going? He goes, well, I'm waiting on some other parts. I said, you mean like tuners and stuff? And he goes, no. He said, it bent everything. He said, everything had to be. He said, it hit so hard that the pickups were no longer usable and oh, everything wow. I said. So everything's gone, you know. And basically we're just restocking the guitar with parts again and I was like, okay. Um, so, <laughs> funny story, um, Don um, from the stagecoach, Don, uh, Don, Kelly. Don Kelly was kind of working out there because he loved guitars and 
he was helping out Joe do some things. And so uh, he sanded this neck down in the back. Well, I noticed after a while I'd be playing up here and the string would fall off. And I went in and just said, Joe, what's wrong with this? And the first thing Joe does is he sits down and he goes, bam, like that. And he went, I think maybe that fixed it. Yeah. I was like, you can do that? He's like, it's a stick of wood. You know? That's like, right. He, like, you he know, popped so, it back into the right spot on the, yeah. on the neck. Yeah. But it turns out I that, mean on the body. that Don had accidentally sounded a little too much right there. And so yeah. Joe got, did his magic thing. And I went to pick it up. And I went, I don't even know where that spot was. He goes, yeah, exactly. You know, so. Yeah. So it was all back, but anyway, this is the, the second neck and, you know. And then these, it looks like these tuners have been replaced. It looked like, like it had Cluson type tuners on there at some point. Were they black or? or? No, the original ones were chrome and yeah. uh, I think I, they just kind of wore out at some point. And, yeah. and I don't know how I got these or where I got them, but. Um, yeah, they're locking spurtsels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're cool. And originally it had EMGs on there. When did the, when did the, uh, so I guess those were pretty hip pickups, you know, all through the 80s and 90s. And so that was kind of like the thing to go with. So the EMGs, um, I don't know how that happened. I, I got a call one day uh, on my code phone back in the day from Corner Music. and said, hey, Jeff King, you, you got a package here. I went, what? So I go over to Corner Music and I said, Somebody said I had a package, and they said, here, it's to you, but it's you know, to us. And I went, okay, thanks. I was like, what is this? And I go outside and open it up, and it's like three EMG pickups. And I'm like, wow, somehow, I can't remember if I had talked with somebody, or I don't remember what, how this all transpired, but they were, uh, they were Tele, their first version of a Tele pickup. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. I can get, they're very clear and fat, and, but they don't sound like the Strat clean, you know. So I used those for a long time. And then I went to Joe one day, um, as I was doing more sessions, I was like, I'm tired of hearing this. <laughs> this yeah. These were awesome, you yeah. know. And they're on a lot of stuff that I did. And I said, I need something different to hear. And he said, I said, what about this and this? And you know. <laughs> You come back tomorrow, and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And, and I, I think we went through several incarnations of stuff, but I think what these are are DiMaggio vintage noiseless telly. Yeah. And I'm really happy with them, and they've been in there for a bunch of years. So. And then that middle one's a Duncan Hot Strat Stack. The middle one is a, yes. and. Yeah. It's the blender knob. Yeah. What does the switch do? It makes it so you can... So I can use these two. Right. You yeah. Know, like a telly. Yeah. It's, it's this. Yeah. You know, but... Um, and with a blender, you can blend in just a tiny... But, you know, I, I found myself not using that. So uh, at one point when we were re... Configuring, I said, Joe, just just take that middle one out, and he said, you know, Keith Urban is really big right now, and you know he's got that telly with the with the one missing there, and he's, I don't think you want to take that out. <laughs> I'm like, he goes because it might look like, I'm like, just whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. The, doc, the, the doctor yeah, told right, you what yeah. you needed to do, and you did it. The yeah, same you, way JT <laughs> corn floss used to look at me like, yeah. oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Well, let's. Uh, have, have we have we learned everything about this guitar? I, I love the finish gone. You know where you've you know played the uh, played the finish off underneath the pickups, and I guess in between your hand resting there and your pick hitting it and different I things. I guess yeah. You know the whatever, but yeah, it's a it's. Probably my favorite. Yeah, very cool. And I don't know if you. Can oh get yes, we we didn't talk about that. So these are these are all these you know signatures of of living and past uh, you know people. There's Reggie Young and Willie Weeks and golly, Caps, Jimmy Caps and Porter Wagner and Loretta Lynn and uh, I'll tell you how this started. It didn't start with me at a session going, hey, sign my guitar. Yeah. This you know we were doing all these TV shows. 
and I did some TV show and Earl Scruggs was on it. So Earl Scruggs was out on this little runway they had. We, I think we were at the Wild Horse filming this thing and he started to walk back and stopped and spoke to every band member and he was talking to me and I went, I've got to get, this is a, huge for me because I loved him as a, from a kid, you know, and one of the uh, TV people, I said, hey, you got a Sharpie? And they're like, yeah, here. And I went, Earl, would you, would you sign my guitar up here on the horn so it won't go away? And he went, oh, sure, I'd love to do that. And so he did it. And then I just thought, I'm never going to sell this guitar. Yeah. It's, it's only going to mean something to me. So I started having my friends sign it and you know, guys that I loved, like Reggie, and, you know, some of them are starting to fade. At one point, Joe did a spray over on it, but it's time to do it again. But I got Charlie Pride like two weeks before he passed away. I was on a CMA show and I was in, in the band and house band. And, um, Kicks and Ronnie and, you know, just people I worked with. So. Yeah. But again, thinking I'm probably never going to sell this. It's only going to be worth something to me at some point, so... That, that's that's kind of like your uh, your kind of signature instrument that you're kind of. It's if I had to have one, I'd probably have this. Yeah, you know. So, all right. What what else you got? Here we got your Gretsch. Tell us about this. I think it's a duo jet. Yeah. Um, it's cool. I had um, I had a moment with Gretsch where we were doing stuff together and they were very kind to me. And so uh, Pat, has actually Reba had a song that had a Gretsch sounding guitar on it. And um, I wanted to replicate that live. So I went to Gretsch and said, do you have something I can use for a tour? And lots of times they'll say, sure, yeah. And then at the end of it, it's, you know, dinged up and beat up and they're like, sometimes they'll, you know, they'll make you a really good deal on it. And sometimes it's just, well, you know, you did a bunch of TV shows and just don't worry about it. So this was one of the don't worry about it. And um, it's become, you know, I love this guitar a lot. It just has a cool sound. And, you know, like I said, there were seven snare drums that gave up their lives for this finish. Yeah, the, <laughs> the finish is amazing on yeah. that. That's, yeah. that's definitely a, uh, a crowd-pleasing uh, guitar. Because, I mean, that, that, you know, when the lights hit that, you oh, know. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And I had Joe change the, um, change the bridge back here to a little more roller bridge. And, yeah. But it's, you know, it's the typical. The sound. The sound of pop country, one yes. of them. Yes. Know? So, and I don't know what this switch does, but, uh, you know, it. Perkins it, you know, for. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why Gretsch always had the most comple complex wiring, you know, that it was just hard to understand. Yeah. That's like, know. and why do you need a switch that turns it off, that kills the sound? Yeah. Yeah, I always did a lot of odd things. I've got a few other Gretches. I've got a mid '60s Tennessean that has some interesting switches on it, and um, I've got a '64 Chet Atkins Nashville, the orange one, with, yeah. the, with the painted on F holes. Yeah, and I think it's got the rubber mute that sticks up. Yes, which is is really fun. You know, it's a tuning nightmare, but it it's cool for. For one thing, you know. Yeah, for when you want that muted yeah. you know, sound. But yeah, that's the one thing people don't think about the fact that when those mutes come up, it messes up the tuning. Oh, yeah. And we got the Tom Anderson Strat here. Yes, this is a wonderful Strat. Um, I'm not sure when I got it. Um, probably around 2000. And um, I met Tom at an AM show and uh, Roy that worked for him. They're, you know, there was just a great bunch out there in, in California. And I loved the color of this and I wanted a Strat to take on the road, do other things with. Um, I've got an old 64 that I use a lot. And 
just wanted a, a more modern version of that. So this became that. And then when I started doing the Reba stuff, this became my Reba touring guitar. So it stayed out on the road and, um, you know, not, not at sessions so much, but um, interesting, you know, there's all kinds of jokes out on the road, okay? Mm -hmm. So our, uh, our video director out there, I put his name here and <laughs> I tell the guy in front of me, hey, at some point I'm gonna stand still and you zoom in on that. And you know, back on, in video world, they have, you know, however many cameras and, and he's like, what? <laughs> and he just says, Hi. Hello, to his, hello, yeah. Bischoff, you know, so. And then this is for my tech, so he can remember which way doesn't buzz. Ah. And um, I don't know what that does. Yeah. And that one doesn't do that, but. Um, so is that, does it have like a dummy coil, or, or how, how does it uh, kill the hum? Uh, they're just split. Oh, okay. I think. Okay, they're like stacked. I, I think boxes. so, yeah. yeah. And, um. It did have a, it did have a whammy bar. Um, on the George Strait tour, when we were, Reba George Strait, we were doing In the Round, In the Middle. And um, my guitar tech at the time was keyboard tech as well. And um, Doug Sizemore, the keyboard player, and, and MD had this rig. And sometimes, I don't know if it was a power thing, it would just go, and one night we're playing at the end of a song and, <laughs> and I see my tech run to shut it off. And the front of the house guys are all pulling, you know, trying to figure out where it's coming from. And so the drum tech brings me the guitar for the next song, which is this, it had the little whammy bar in it. And so my tech would come up and since we're on the stage and they're on the floor, he would hand the guitar up like this. So the drum tech's like, you know, and the, the bar falls out somewhere along the trip from wherever it starts to yeah. by the time. And I looked at him and I said, where's the, you know, the crowd's going yeah. crazy. I said, where's the bar? And he went, what? I said, the bar, the guitar bar. He went, Pfft. and he walks off and I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> his name, his name is Keith. I said, Keith, where? And he's like, yeah. And, and he gets back, later I found out, he gets back over to Kenny, my tech, and he says, Kenny says, well, what was he talking about? He goes, I don't know, he's looking for some bar that has guitars. And he says, we ain't got time for that. Yeah. And he says, what? And he's thinking I'm talking about a bar. I was yeah. drinking at the guitar bar later. I'm like, yeah. no, I need the bar. I need the bar. And the bar was never found, so I just gave it up. I was just tightening it, it down up. a little bit and, you know, left yeah. it, but... But I use this on a lot of Reba shows, and now it's back into my session world because it's just such a great sounding, great yeah. feeling instrument. You've got a hip shot detuner on there? Well, that started as the uh, four. The, the Reba um, Little Rock. Yeah. Until <laughs> she said, I think we want to change the key on that. It's like, yeah. she said, I want to go down to C, I want to go down lower. Yeah. And they worked it out, you know, and uh, Doug came to me and said, we're gonna drop that Little Rock down to C. And I went, oh golly. Okay, so my first thing was a, 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 a I was like that, we can't, <laughs> that's not right. So now I have a, a way of doing it digitally and, and it's, you know, it's interesting. So, so, you, so you pitch, so I drop this and then, because I'm in a different part of the stage, my tech hits a button and it goes right. to the program and it drops it a whole step and we're in C. And then when I, by the time I get back over here, I am, at that point I'm playing D, which is C. Yeah. But by the time I get back, I'm playing C, which is real C. Yeah. So, and then I control it from that point on because I'm back over, but there have been a few times when he did, <laughs> he forgot, <laughs> and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I'm what's just going? Oh, I'm gonna get you. <laughs> <laughs> what's worse than playing the big lick and being in the wrong and key? In the wrong key, and yeah. nothing you can do about it. <laughs> but hey, it's part of that part of the joy of the road, you know. Yes. So tell us about this pedal board. 
Is this is this your 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 around town? What what is the, the what is the normal usage of this? It's kind of you know um, back in the cartage whenever cartage was crazy days. You know, I had a pedal board. I would keep in cartage, and one I would all run and gun kind of a thing. But now I just now it's just I just have the one. I mean, I have other pedal boards, but smaller ones and things I do. But this is kind of my this is my session board, basically. Yeah. Um, and you know the guys at XTS, yes. Barry and yeah. Greg, and yeah, they. Um, I took a bunch of pedals to them in a bag and said, you know, I'm sick of doing this. I'm, you know, it's been fun for a lot of years to do it myself, but um, it needed some other under the hood parts, and they just uh, put it all together for me. And um, is it Justin Butler that does the? I can't remember the name of his company that yeah, does. Yeah, it's uh, Through Tone. Through Tone. Okay. Yes. Um, sexy volume pedal with a different chord. Mm-hmm. And um, so I've got, um, you know, this switcher here, so I don't have to reach up here and do that. Right. So I can turn on, you know. Just whatever. Um, and it's basically most of the stuff that I use on sessions. And I have a little... Um, a little thing over here, I can connect another little board if I want, or other stuff, I can put it in, in line in here. But, yeah. you know, use the Keeley compressor, and most of the, most of my stuff is, um, I just kind of keep it, the level straight up, and that off, mostly, unless it's a solo that I need a little something for. And, you know, a few overdrive pedals, and a couple delays, and, when, when did you make the shift away from the big rack thing? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. It was a slow move, but because I had a head with the rack and I started right. using that more, so. Yeah. So, yeah, so you've got, uh, you know, of course, the HX that can cover all sorts of uh, bases. I'm assuming you're using this as an expression pedal. Mm hmm. Yeah. And then. Uh, Reverb and delays and yeah, more reverb. Spring verb, yeah. Pog, EQ pedal, mm -hmm. dude, also, yeah. yeah. Just stuff, the light speed, you know, just things come and go yeah. occasionally on here, so. Yeah. Tell us about the amp that you got there. Well, this old Harvard I bought from a friend of mine last year. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mentioned this to you before, but I had a, um, I'd been looking for a mid 60s blackface deluxe. And um, I, I just looked around and I, you know, sometimes when you start looking for stuff, all of a sudden it pops up somewhere. Yeah. And so I, I had randomly texted a friend of mine one day that lived in California, uh, David Starr. He's got Starr guitars out there. And I said, hey, David, if you see a deluxe come through your store, I'm looking for this. And he said, I said, if you come, you know, happen to see one, whatever, let me know. And, you know, I'll put out some feelers, different people. He got right back to me and sent me a picture of um, a blackface deluxe, 64, and this Harvard and a uh, 56 deluxe tweed. And... There was something else too, and I was like, "Wow, where are those?" And he goes, "Well, they're upstairs." I, I didn't want to sell them, but he said, "Now I'm starting to think because I don't use them anymore." Wondering if, so you know, we agreed on a price for the the blackface deluxe, and um, I got it and loved it. And he, he said, "I'm going to bring along this tweed deluxe. Just keep it and mess with it for a while and see if it's something you might be interested in." And I have another tweed. I can't remember if it's called a Vibrolux or a Tremolux. It's one of those, but it's been recovered with some other kind of wild tweed looking stuff. And yeah. uh, I just fell in love with that Deluxe. And then he said, hey, um, I was gonna keep the Harvard, um, but here's this too, why don't you mess with this? And I'm like, well. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I mean, you love amps. I yeah. love amps, I mean, I've got, 
I think the last count I had maybe 35 heads and probably 20 combos. And it's just, um, it's just a problem. <laughs> it is, it is a problem. Those, those are really cool amps. Those, those are kind of, they're somewhat rare. You right. don't you don't yeah. see a ton of them because they were kind of in a weird spot in the uh, in the lineup because mm -hmm. it kind of went champ, you know, in the tweed era in the the narrow panel like this is, they went from the champ to the Princeton, which at that point was just a, a champ with a bigger speaker in it. It was basically still single ended, a single power tube, but the Harvard was the smallest amp that had two power tubes on it, and then it jumped up to the Vibrolux, which is an identical amp but with tremolo on it. And then above that was the Deluxe, which, really? which had more power, but it didn't have tremolo. And then the Tremolux was the Deluxe with tremolo. And then you get up into the bigger amps like the Bandmaster that had 310s, mm -hmm. the Pro that had a 15 and all those. And so it was kind of a weird amp in the lineup that a lot of guys would either get the Champ or Princeton or they would jump up to the Deluxe, or they would get the one below it, the Vibrolux, which was that amp, but also with tremolo on there. Right. And so you just don't see that many of them. And, uh, but, you know, of course, it's famous as being the Steve Cropper amp. Oh. Because that's what, you know, he used on a lot of the Booker wow. T and the MG stuff was. And then I think also Ace Freely used one a lot on, on Kiss stuff, really? where he, he used one, you know, cranked all the way up. And wow. so those are kind yeah. of the, the famous uses of the Harvard, but it's the same amp as the uh, as the Tweed Vibrolux, except it doesn't have the tremolo on there. Okay, well then it's a tremolux that I have. Yeah, because it's, it's bigger. bigger. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I just, you know, it was yeah. just there and I got it and we, you know, he made a good deal and so I, yeah. you know, but um, I've been using this at home some, you know, by, with my 212 Marshall cabinet or my 212 Bogner, which is in a, you know, a little, uh, bunker under my house that nobody can ever hear. So, yeah. Um, and I've used all those like that, and they're just super cool. I mean, they yeah. saturate differently and quickly and um, organically. I guess is yeah. the word that gets. You know. How much? Uh, how much home recording do you do where you where people are sending you tracks? You know, I'm probably fifty percent. Yeah. You know, give or take either side depending on the week. Um, you know. Overdubbing at home is fun, and I, I find myself, you know, I'll take something on and I'll sit there and tweak on it and tweak on it until I'm a, until I'm down to about five dollars an hour. Yeah. But at least I send stuff that I really I'm like really happy with this. I've yeah. turned over every stone and checked it out, and you know the parts all work together and all that stuff. But um, then there's the not seeing anybody and. Not getting the, the feedback or the, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, or I don't, you know, I don't like that, whatever. But it's all of that, you know, and the hangout with, it's just so much fun to hang out with the guys at a session. You know, we laugh and cut up and things happen during the tracking, you know, while you somebody will play something, it's like, wow, you know, that sparked me to do something later that's it's just the music, you know, yeah. is... Pass on either a good piece of advice that you've been given or that you wish, you know, someone would have told you. Boy, that could take hours, but, and I've, met, I've messed up on every one of them, but I think that, uh, you know, two things that were told to me is always let the song dictate what needs to happen. And after you do this for a while, you know what that means. I, I think at first I didn't really understand that, but I'm more understanding about that now. And the other thing very early on that uh, this uh, publisher friend of mine had actually worked uh, at a record label, he said, you know, if you want to do sessions, you need to learn, you need to listen to every kind of music. You need to, you need to, to develop you know, a knowledge of what swing music is of, because you just never know every day, you know, one day you might be playing a Highway 40 blues type thing with a telly and the next day it might be a Led Zeppelin type thing, you know, and, um, you know, in our world, early sessions, you never really went that far with like dirty stuff, you know, but now, I mean, everything is wide open. Um, country, I think the, uh, 
country country is coming back. You know, there's some real clean things happening now, and then there's some real dirty stuff too. So yeah. it's it's all there. And do you remember Tower Records on West End? Yes. So I used to go into Tower about once a month, and I'd come out with a stack of CDs, and I would go get some world music thing, you know, and I would go to the front and ask, what are you listening to now? And they would say, you know, I'm listening to this punk record. Okay, I want need one of those. And I'd get, you know, um, a couple of whoever was the top of the country market at that point, and whoever was the top of the rock market. And, you know, at that point you start learning in this job, you start learning how to look at like, how does the edge get his sound, you know? Yeah. And, and everything is all, I mean, all the, all the opinions are all over the place, so, but you can only do what you can, what you can do. It's like, how do I get what's perceived as that sound? If somebody calls something like, you know, we want to, can you do a guitar thing like the Edge would do? It's like, yeah. okay, yeah, boom, now I'm, I figured it out. Not right now, but I figured it out, you know, last month, so. Um, and then, you know, you learn some swing stuff and you learn how they approach that and the licks they use, how their mind works a little, you know, how to get that tone. Because I, I found, for me, if I can find the tone, I can kind of find the part that goes with that, which gets back to the song, you know, that's the most important part of it. So it's my advice, my two cents. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for coming down and, and talking with us. Thank you for, you know, bringing your guitars and telling your story. It was, it was a hoot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. Enjoyed it. <laughs>